Please visit sleepapia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Awake Speaker Series. My name is Kevin Bradley, and I'm delighted today to have a guest with us, Lisa Graham. Lisa is a registered nurse and also a registered nutritionist. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you well, for joining us. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, for having me. So, Lisa, before we get into our questions, I'm going to go through your bio because it's quite an interesting and very accomplished career. Um, and it's good for people to know your, your very exciting background. Thanks. So, like I said, Lisa is a registered nurse and certified diabetes educator with over 26 years of healthcare experience. Lisa received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Southern California. Lisa served as a coordinator of Northside Hospital Diabetes and Nutrition Education Program until her departure to start her own company. Lisa is the CEO of Renew and Live LLC, a diabetes nutrition and education company which specializes in bringing diabetes education to where the clients are. Her company contracts with physician groups, managed care organizations, state and local health departments, community organizations, again to bring diabetes education to clients in their facilities. She believes we can no longer wait for patients to come to us and that we actually need to make health education more accessible to patients in various modalities to assist changing patient outcomes. So, wow, Lisa, it's an excellent um, bio you have, and, and we're really delighted to have you here and share your expertise with us. Thank you. Um, like one of the subjects that we were looking at is specifically mm -hmm. around the blood test A1C. Yeah. There's been quite a lot of publicity about it recently. Um, I, I'd heard in the television network, some people are saying, you know, they've seen this advertisement, go get your A1C checked. Yeah. Can, can you just let us know what that is? Yes. Um, well, A1C is another blood test to really see how well an individual is managing their diabetes as well as we use it to diagnose, of course, diabetes. Um, it's something that's been around for quite some time, but just in recent years, we've used it as what we call a diagnostic tool. So we're actually using, utilizing that to, to diagnose diabetes. Great. And would one elevated test be sufficient for a diagnosis of either diabetes or risk of future diabetes? Well, it, it, it really, um, it sometimes depends in regards to uh, when you look at the particular um, tests. So there's two tests. Let's start here. There's two tests that we utilize to see if someone has, uh, of course, diabetes. And one is a what we call a fasting blood sugar, which tells us, you know, someone may fast overnight, come into the office um, and have their blood sugar checked. And based on those numbers that we're telling people that they could be at risk for diabetes or they actually diagnosed, of course, with diabetes. Um, and then there's the A1C test. And the A1C test is one that we can do at any time. You don't need to be fasting. And this test basically looks back um, three months, and it looks back to see how the blood sugar has been running over a three, two to three month, of course, period. Um, I often tell patients that this is a test that we can't, of course, cheat on because it's looking at history. So again, like I said, it's looking back to see how your blood sugar has been running, uh, of course, over this time. Um, the fasting blood sugar can sometimes be affected by what I did before I got to the office, what may have happened the night before. But as I said, that A1C test is looking at history. So um, I, I do say, and, and not that the other is not reliable, but I do say that people, it's, it's one that they can, can definitely trust in regards to uh, looking at what their numbers have been. Sure. And obviously, because it's taken that, you know, window period of three months, there's no benefit of repeating it if one became elevated and doing it in a week or two. Your, your advice would be to wait at least another three months? Yes. So oftentimes when we have someone that comes in, of course, with an elevated, um, of course, um, A1C, and I, I'd like to, is it okay if I talk about the numbers right now in regards to what that, what those numbers look like? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. 
So um, one of the things when you look at that A1C, we have it's measured, um, you might see 5.7 or sometimes you hear people say they're trying to get their A1C less than seven. So when we look at the A1C, a normal A1C is 5.7 or less. So anything under, of course, uh, 5.7, there's no, that's no diabetes. When you look at an A1C of 5.7 to 6.4, this is what we call pre-diabetes. So these are people that the numbers are elevated, but it's not elevated enough to call it, of course, diabetes. And then we look at anything above 6.4. Uh, four. So at 6.5 or higher, that of course is diabetes. So with that, oftentimes what if we do have someone that's in maybe a pre-diabetes range or that number is elevated, um, it it can depend again on how elevated that is. If we're just slightly over, of course, at 6.5 or 6.4, um, the doctor may say at that time, well, let's try to do some lifestyle changes. So let's look at you know, maybe changing your diet, incorporating exercise. We can definitely see a difference, of course, across the board with diabetes when we look at weight loss. So those are some things that we may not say, let's come back next week, as you're saying, to just recheck this. Let's give you some time to see with incorporating some of these lifestyle changes, if that may, uh, of course, change what that um, number is. Sure, sure. And that leads me to think about, you know, who should get an A1C test and when? Well, you know, when we look at diabetes, unfortunately, um, type 2 diabetes, um, type 2 diabetes is currently at a pandemic rate. So we're dealing with one pandemic, but diabetes, and that of course means that we're seeing diabetes in parts of the world we've never seen it before. So with that being said, we really encourage anyone, um, of course, you know, with their yearly checkup that they should be doing, of course, testing, of course, for this you know, fasting blood sugar, as well as at A1C. Um, I really, you know, we're starting to see, of course, pre-diabetes in younger, of course, in adolescents. So this is something I just think that needs to be a part of your yearly physical. Um, everyone should be doing that, but sometimes that we may not have you know access to that or the ability to do that. Um, so I tell people if there's you know there may be um, a community event or health fair that's in your area, you won't be able to get the A1C, but you could get your blood sugar checked. So we're saying at least once a year that everyone's blood sugar, uh, of course, should be checked, and this A1C also done once a year. Now, if people are diagnosed with diabetes, we usually will do this a couple of times a year just to make sure that we're keeping, of course, those numbers under control. And a person that has been diagnosed with diabetes, their ultimate goal is to keep that number less than seven. So then it goes side and side by the, the therapy that they're on to see that it's sufficient enough to keep it well controlled. Um, you know, and I was thinking as well, um, what sort of groups, is there any special ethnicity groups or does family history play into the fact that maybe people should think of, you know, let's get this test done because my mother has diabetes, for example. Absolutely, absolutely. So we know that, of course, a family history of diabetes definitely puts us at risk. Um, various ethnic groups like African-Americans, um, Latinos, um, Asians, um, Indians, all, of course, are at greater risk for diabetes. Um, those who are overweight, of course, it puts them at risk for diabetes. Uh, but I always tell people, too, because sometimes they people think that, well, if I am, you know, thin, that I may not be at risk, because sometimes if people look at that people are overweight, that they're more likely to um, get, of course, diabetes. But as I said, that, you know, people who are normal weight can also be at risk, and especially when we have that family history. So one of the things I tell people is that across the board, there's certain things we should be doing, our blood pressure, cholesterol, checking, of course, for diabetes, because um, the other thing with diabetes is a person can have this five to six years and have no signs and symptoms. So having these tests done are so important. And like I said, that A1C, because that is, I won't say, um, I don't want to say more accurate because of course with testing, there's always a possibility for us, uh, some inaccuracy, but it is a better predictor because it is looking, of course, like I said, at that history. Sure, sure. And you're right. I mean, knowing this and being able to treat it and control your blood pressure or sorry, your blood sugar will will help alleviate some of the, you know, 
comorbidities and coexisting yeah. conditions that goes alongside with you know uncontrolled diabetes which is you know can be quite severe in some cases and you know end organ damage or neuropathy and stuff like mm -hmm. that so is there any way lisa if i went in to have my a1c checked tomorrow mm -hmm. is there any way that you know maybe it could be elevated and that could be a false elevation what factors could influence that well, you know, we have, um, of course, some of the things with that, with that um, A1C, we are looking at red blood cells. So that's what we're actually looking at to see, of course, how that sugar, of course, has been running over those last couple of months. So when you have, of course, conditions like anemia or um, someone that has maybe sickle cell or, you know, kidney disease, liver disease, things that affect, of course, um, that red blood cells or red blood cell production, uh, those, of course, things could contribute to maybe that test not being accurate. And then there's certain, of course, medications, um, or supplements or things that may be affected by that. Um, so definitely, you know, when you're going in, of course, for any testing, having a good history, medical history um, that, you know, of course, your, your physician has, of course, or your provider has on you would also help them when we look at, of course, those numbers. Because when you think about diabetes, that there's so many people, of course, none of us want to have anything. So there are those questions that come up. Can this be, is this real? Is this, you know, um, is could this be false? So I think is more information that your healthcare provider has, they can kind of look at some of these other, uh, of course, options to see if that could have affected, of course, that that um, test result. Yeah, you know, and I think you know, after reading your bio and stuff, it's great that you take this to the communities, yeah. to your the primary care physicians, and you know, it's almost like outreach for the public there so that they can have all this checked and be aware of it um, because as you say it is definitely on the increase yeah you're actually in toronto we see a lot of that as well with some of our um you know new immigrants from say places like southeast asia and sri lanka and stuff that mm -hmm. you know ultimately unfortunately end up um with kidney disease due to uncontrolled diabetes yes yeah. You know, and it does make me feel as well that sometimes, you know, medication can actually play a role in that too. And mm -hmm. when someone has an actual kidney transplant and they're on high dose steroids, for example, mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, for the first month or two, that can actually, you know, as you're aware of, um, play in. So it's very good to get an overall history, physical, you know, family history, weight, you know, nutritional consult, mm -hmm. you know, all those things are all relevant to, to controlling this. Yes. And to your point, there's so many things also that do affect um, here with sleep apnea. We know that that affects, of course, blood sugar numbers. So anything stress, of course, can affect blood sugar numbers. So those things, looking at all of that. So oftentimes that people look at just what I ate, but I, I tell people there's so many other factors. So to your point, I could have been in a very stressful, this pandemic, of course, puts us in a stressful, uh, of course, situation. And just being in that stressful situation over a certain period of time, or if I have not been sleeping well over a certain period of time, those that can actually affect that A1C. So as I said, when I have, of course, that number that may be elevated, then it may be, okay, let me look back and see what those three months look like. Well, what, what was I doing during those months? And then maybe I need to adjust some of those things. Well, yes, I was under a lot of stress or I haven't been sleeping well, or gosh, my diet was just horrible, of course, during that time. And especially if people have had um, times when the numbers were, of course, uh, within range where they should be. So to your point, looking back and saying what's been going on over that, you know, these those last three months. Sure, sure. And I've definitely seen people, you know, that in, in my industry where, you know, people have come forward actually to, you know, try and work out and see if they'll be eligible to be a living kidney donor, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and they have a slightly elevated, you know, fasting sugar, but you're right, that's a snapshot of what's been going on the day before. Yeah. And maybe their A1C is borderline high, but I've seen people that go make lifestyle adjustments and cut down on the carbs and the sugar, exercise, and, and have really turned it around, actually. Yes, yes, absolutely. And that's, like I said, no one wants to have anything, but 
with diabetes, it is something that we can do something about. And by making those small, of course, changes sometimes that people truly can, uh, of course, affect their numbers. And, and one other thing I just want to say, too, is that oftentimes um, I have um, patients that will say, well, I, don't, I won't check my blood sugar. These are, of course, individuals that have diabetes. I won't check my blood sugar. I'll just go get this A1C. But I, I want people to understand that that A1C number is important, but it's also important to look at what that day-to-day of course, number is because all of those numbers that are going on over those three months that I'm checking my blood sugar is a result of what that A1C is going to be. So when I see those numbers, of course, you know, day in and day out, it gives me the opportunity to make a change right away. So if I see that I'm running high, okay, let me make some adjustments so that when I get to that three month, uh, of course, um, checkup, that now that A1C, of course, may be better because I was able to make those adjustments along the way. So I just wanted to add that because a lot of times that people just say, well, I'm just going to just get that done and are not monitoring, of course, you know, during that time period. But it's so important because, like I said, it gives us an opportunity to make changes, of course, along the way. Sure. And that's great advice, you know, and especially for our community as well. We did do a speaker series in the past, which, which we talked about, you know, metabolic syndrome, diabetes risks and all the things that are associated with obstructive sleep apnea. Mm-hmm. And again, I always go back to the fact that, you know, we, we seem to think or a lot of people think that, you know, when we go to sleep, everything shuts down, but it's not. It's your body getting repair. You know, hormonal repair, you know, your sleep, your everything's just getting fixed almost. Um, (laughs) So that's why it's so important. And I'm I'm glad you raised that as well um, for our communities. Is that something that when you talk to patients, you know, do you ever include sleep um, in the discussion with them? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because what you said, that is the time for the body to repair. And we've learned, of course, so much now that we didn't know before in regards to how sleep affects the body and not just blood sugars. We look at weight. We look at so many, of course, other things. So it is something that I'm always talking about to, uh, of course, my patients. And one of the things I'm, I say to them, too, is why are you not sleeping? So a lot of times it's just, you know, people think, of course, I get older or like you said, stress or different, but it could be you know, the problems like, you know, of course, with you all, um, of course, deal with here is sleep apnea, um, insomnia, there may be medications, there's so many things. So not just to write it off as that, well, you know, I just, yeah, I just don't get much sleep. We really need to dig deeper and find out why that is, because the lack of sleep can impact the body so significantly. So I think it's important that we understand why that's happening. Sure. Great advice. Great advice, Lisa. Well, listen, thank you so much for sharing your your wonderful expertise with our community. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleephappia.org slash donate for details. SAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free. 